Thank you very much, Mike. It's really an honor to be here today to speak to you. It was exactly 10 years ago, last week, that in Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore's book and movie were released. And what I want to do in my 15 minutes to summarize for you the state of play in sustainability is in David Letterman fashion, give you the 10 major trends I see that have emerged over the past decade in the area of sustainability in two categories. Carbon, which is what Al Gore was talking about, climate change, and non-carbon, five in each category. We're going to do this really rapidly, David Letterman style, right? 10 trends, 15 minutes, here we go. Number one, the solar industry, 15 years ago, was a 100 million, with an M, dollar market worldwide. Last year, it became a $120 billion market worldwide. As a basis of comparison, last year, the global online advertising industry was $180 billion. And the growth rate of solar is significantly higher than online advertising globally. Why is that? This, cur this curve looks a little bit like Moore's Law, doesn't it? That's the cost reduction in solar panels. Now, the slope of the line is not nearly as steep as Moore's Law, semiconductors. But here's the thing. In energy, we don't need orders of magnitude for renewables to compete with fossil fuels. In many parts of the world today, solar is at grid parity, unsubsidized. Number two, wind power. Last year, a $180 billion market. You add solar and wind together, it's a $300 billion market that emerged out of nowhere over the past 10 or 15 years, which amazingly is almost exactly equal to the global semiconductor business. And the growth rates are very different between the two. Number three, the observation I want to make to you is solar and wind renewables today are incomplete solutions because they provide intermittent power. Solar provides energy when the sun is out, wind when it's windy. They don't provide baseload power, 24 by 7 dispatchable power. So the holy grail in carbon sustainability is the company or the companies that come forward with baseload renewable power at grid parity. Elon Musk would tell you it's the merger of batteries and solar panels. Fuel cell companies would argue with that. The companies that do this will be major disruptive forces in the $4 trillion worldwide electricity market. Number four, bad news. We're on a bad trend line. I'm going to give you a carbon dashboard right now over the past 10 years. There's no good news in this. Here's some data. Carbon concentration, parts per million in the atmosphere a century ago were 315. 10 years ago were 381. Now we're 404. Scientists say it better not go over 450. Sorry. Temperature, 10 years ago, six-tenths of a degree centigrade above the 20th century average. Now a degree. Arctic ice used to cover 2.5 million square miles at the height of the winter. 10 years ago, reduced to 2 million. This year, 1.7. Temperatures this year in the Arctic are 4 to 11 degrees warmer than the 20th century average. And the last one is fracking, which I could have put on the top 10 list, but it's really in the carbon category as I think about it. And so it's, it's a tower of Babel out there where the proponents say it's good because it brings jobs, and the opponents say it's bad because what about carbon? And the number I want to give you is three compared to 907. Here's a staggering comparison. 15 years ago, the state of Oklahoma would have, on average, three earthquakes a year. Last year, it had 907. And the scientists believe that's because of the injection, reinjection into the subsurface of millions and millions of gallons of wastewater. Number five, the Paris Accord. For those of you that follow this, the United Nations IPCC uh, reached agreement several months ago. To not, 196 countries agreed to try to keep the temperature increase below 2 degrees centigrade. So on the one hand, that's really good news that 196 countries could come to agreement. The bad news, it's not an enforceable agreement. And so we can't predict anything will actually come of it. That's on the carbon side. 
So on the non-carbon side of sustainability, I'm going to give you five. But I want to start with what is sustainability? One commonly used definition is a set of businesses providing for the needs of the current generation without compromising the needs of future generations. And so certainly that's energy and carbon and climate change, and it's become so much more over the past 10 years. Number one, agriculture and water. So the challenge in agriculture is we have a growing population and a growing middle class. The middle class numbers are staggering. Here are the numbers. At the beginning of the century, 15 years ago, there were one billion members of the middle class worldwide. Fast forward to now, one becomes 1.8 billion, and the projection is in the next 15 years, 1.8 billion goes to four or five billion. It is the most momentous demographic event in human history. We're living through the midst of it right now, and it's putting enormous pressure on our resources, in particular on agriculture. Water. Michael Burry, you might have heard of him. He's the genius in the big short. He's the guy that saw the subprime mortgage crisis before it hit, put everything, all the chips on that, shorted the big short, and made a billion dollars personally in the process. He was interviewed in New York Magazine a few months ago. And the second to last question in the interview is, what are you investing in now? And his answer was, water scarcity. It's the biggest issue facing humanity. But it's very difficult to invest in. And it's difficult to invest in because water is heavy. It doesn't transport easily. He said, but I figured out how to do it. And the way to do it is to invest in farmland that has senior water rights in areas with secure water sources, convert a little bit of the water every year into crops that are then exported into regions of the world experiencing water scarcity. Okay? That's, that's uh, Michael Burry. There's a lot of innovation coming in, wa in water, and we need a lot more. Second, non-carbon, sustainability. If you're interested in education, education technology, you came to the right place today. The leader in education innovation is GSV. Mike Moe, Mark Flynn, the entire team. They saw this years ago. I was lucky enough to be in April in San Diego attending the Arizona State University GSV Education Summit. It was phenomenal. 3,500 people. Everybody was there. The keynote speaker was Bill Gates. Here's what I want to share with you that uh, I found so electrifying from Gates is he talked about adaptive learning, which is a term of art in education, which basically is deploying Moore's Law so that a student is known by the software and the system, the strengths and weaknesses of the student, and so the course material is customized to exactly where they are. Bring the technology to where the student is, not the student to where the technology is. And we see that theme repeating throughout the economy. And so in agriculture, we have uh, precision agriculture, which is customizing farming methods to the needs of the farm. In healthcare, we have personalized medicine, which is customizing the treatment of a disease to the phenotype and genotype of the patient, likewise in education. Number three. So this is going to seem off topic, but I'm going to bring it back on topic. There are a couple of macro forces in the economy that are pulling more and more people into sustainability. There are many. I'm going to identify two. And these are double-edged swords, globalization and automation. Globalization is the spread of the middle class, which spreads well throughout the world and means that we can adopt sustainability solutions globally more rapidly. Automation is robotics and artificial intelligence, which means we can automate and do things more quickly. The double-edged part of the sword is globalization has played a big role in this country in hollowing out the middle class. Jobs are going overseas. Automation, John Markoff, a writer for the New York Times, wrote a wonderful book last year. I'd highly recommend it for those of you interested in this topic. The title of the book is Machines of Loving Grace. Think about that. Machines of Loving Grace. And it's a story about the choice that engineers, not the public at large, engineers are making now in laboratories about whether automation, robotics, and AI are designed to augment human activity or displace it. And the implications of the decisions made by engineers distributed throughout the labs in the world 
has broad implications for society at large. Number four, big trend leading to sustainability, the millennials. Ten years ago, the millennials were at the lower end, younger end, were entering the second grade. Now they're here. And what I want to tell you is the millennials are not your mother's generation. Let me give you three statistics. The first is, from a sustainability perspective, 75% say they would pay more for a sustainability product. And you ask the sellers of consumer products, and they, they will tell you they are paying more today for consumer products across the board, food, and nutritious, and so forth. Second statistic, there's a raging debate now uh, in business schools and in corporate America about whether shareholder value is the sole goal of a corporation or whether it's meant to do more than that. 87% of millennials will say it's meant to do more. That's a staggering thing. Business schools didn't teach that way when we grew up. Finally, in the most stunning statistic for the millennials, only 19% of, of them describe themselves as capitalists. 19% of millennials describe themselves as capitalists. Harvard Institute of Politics, this year, a survey. We've arrived at the last megatrend, impact investing. What is impact investing? It's kind of a playoff of what I've talked about the millennials. Corporations with a purpose more than financial returns. So for-profit companies with two central objectives, both of equal weight, the first, is to generate strong investor returns, and the second is to do some good for the world as a central part of the business plan. Not a charitable donation at the end of the year, as a central part of the business plan. And this, the interest in impact investing is taking off in significant part because the millennials are all about it. So the family offices around the world are being pushed by the younger generations in those families, and institutions are coming to the party Last year, Goldman Sachs bought Imprint Capital in San Francisco, which is trying to become the Cambridge Associates of Impact Investing. There's a lot of capital coming in, and it's growing every day. I'm the chairman of a company, as Mike said, SharedX, which is an impact company. We grow high-value specialty crops in emerging countries. And our investment thesis was best ex expressed, again, I'm coming back to Bill Gates, by Bill Gates in this tweet last year. The tweet is a graph. The graph shows what in the ag industry is known as the yield gap. The yield gap is the astonishing differential in bushels per acre comparing a developed and an emerging country farmer. In Gates's example, the differential is five-fold, factor five, not 50%, five-fold differential in production. And the main reason for the difference is because our farmers, American farmers, have two things Emerging country farmers don't, access to capital, and the most advanced sustainable farming techniques. So in one sentence, our business plan at Shared X is to collapse the yield gap, the 5X yield gap, by deploying the most advanced sustainable farming techniques in regions of the world that haven't seen them before. Our vision is to transform agriculture in emerging countries from something that looks like the picture on the left to something that looks like the picture on the right. So in David Letterman style, in rapid fashion, those are what I see as 10 of the largest trends that have emerged in the 10 years since the release of An Inconvenient Truth. And looking forward, when we're back here 10 years from now, 2026, I think with confidence we can predict that the pace of acceleration and sustainability will only quicken. Mike, thanks for inviting me. It's a real pleasure being here. Thank you.